Why, hello there friends, it's Emma here, the Bookish Princess. I hope you're having a wonderful start to your February and your Feb Regency. If you're joining us for the Feb Regency Readathon, this runs throughout the month of February. I'm one of the co-hosts and it celebrates the literature of Britain's Regency era, the time period when Jane Austen lived and wrote the early 1800s. We have a perfect way to kick off the Readathon today with a brand new Feb Regency tag video. The other co-hosts and I came up with these questions. I think they're a lot of fun. You are all tagged so if this sounds fun I hope you'll make it um, this tag video for yourself and definitely let me know down in the comments we do have quite a lot of fun questions here some serious some kind of goofy so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into it the first one is name your top three Regency authors so it should be no surprise <laughs> I'm going to be predictable Jane Austen obviously. And then also Jane Austen's two favorites, Mariah Edgeworth. We're reading Belinda as our group read for Feb Regency this year. And Fanny Burney. This is Evelina by Fanny Burney. I just love Fanny Burney and Mariah Edgeworth. You can definitely see how they inspired Jane Austen. If you like Jane Austen, they do have very similar like good sense, great characterization, interesting scenes. They, I feel like, take you into the Regency era actually even more than Austen because Austen feels so timeless. It feels like she's just writing about human struggles that are eternal you know that like in every age you have to deal with them um and and Mariah Edgeworth and Fanny Burney do that to a certain extent as well but they also paint more pictures of like the society and London and different places that are really fascinating and it feels like you know time travel a trip to that era so these are all excellent authors if you're still deciding what to read for a Feb Regency the next one is name your top three readers Regency poets. Poetry was big in the Regency era and there were many amazing poets. This was the romantic poets and my three favorites are, well you know what, I'll, I'll start with the um, least well known which he is Jane Austen's favorite poet, William Cooper. I got these two beautiful volumes. Oh, look at this. Uh, I lost the cover on one of them. I mean I didn't lose it but it very sadly came apart. These are from 18... I have to be very careful with the other one, 1824. Um, and I found them on eBay. They're so lovely. And uh, yeah, two volumes of William Cooper. He's quoted in some of Austin's works and his lyricism is so beautiful and his poems go so deep. He has a lot of faith and he like ties in his, his struggles with faith so beautifully. So I'd highly recommend Cooper. Just reading a poem could be a great way to participate in Feb Regency. Um, and then the other two, I love the Lake District poet. It's Wordsworth and Coleridge. These guys were actually buddies and they knew each other. Um, so many of the poets, like Keats and um, Shelley and Byron. Shelley and Byron were also like besties um, to, to other Regency era poets. But I think I have to go with Wordsworth and Coleridge. I love the descriptions of nature. I've been to Wordsworth's um, Dove Cottage, a house he lived in in the Lake District. And the Lake D District is so beautiful and Wordsworth captures it so beautifully. I've also been to Tinter. Turn Abbey. That's one of my favorite Wordsworth poems. It's lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey and it's oh, such a beautiful poem. So these, those three are my favorites. And then favorite historical event that happened during this time period in Britain or elsewhere. There was a lot going on. I'm pretty sure I came up with this question and now I can't remember what I was going to say to answer it. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go with the Napoleonic Wars. My brothers love Napoleon, and it makes me realize I don't know enough about Napoleon. I need to read more about his life and about that time period, but I do think it's so fascinating the way those are kind of this backdrop to Austen's novels. Some of Austen's brothers were in the Royal Navy, and of course, like in Persuasion, you hear a little bit about the Navy here and there. Um, so that sort of aspect of the Regency era really fascinates me, and I need to learn more about it. Okay, our next question, this is one of my favorites. The year is 1816. It's a dark and stormy night on Lake Geneva. You're telling ghost stories with three legendary writers. Who are they? Bonus points if they're Regency era writers. Now, this question is of course inspired by the real life story behind Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Where is Frankenstein? Mary Shelley was staying on Lake Geneva with Lord Byron and her husband, Percy Shelley, and Byron challenged them all to write ghost stories and this was what Mary Shelley came up with. I just think that has to be one of the most epic origin stories for like a classic. Last year I read uh, Mary Shelley's travelogue where she writes about this trip to Switzerland and all the different places that they went. 
I'm though gonna go instead of with like Byron and Shelly, I'm actually gonna go back and go with Wordsworth and Coleridge. And my third author is going to be William Wordsworth's sister, Dorothy Wordsworth. Um, she wrote journals. She lived with Wordsworth and his family. She helped him with his writing a lot. In fact, that Tintern Abbey poem I mentioned, Dorothy is sort of mentioned in that poem. He's remembering being there, um, seeing the view with her. I just think they would be a really fun triumvirate. Of course, really, they would be in the Lake District on a stormy lake in the Lake District, but why not Lake Geneva? We can hop over over to a different country. But yeah, honestly, I'm kind of excited to see um, what what authors people pick for this, this question. Our next prompt. The Regency era is named after the Regency of George, Prince of Wales, who ruled in the stead of his father, King George III, from 1811 to 1820. If you had to appoint a regent to rule your booktube channel in your stead, who would it be? So for me, I've had my brothers, um, Athos and Porthos, on my channel. I feel like they would be great picks. It's been so fun um, to share their book collections on here. However, I also, would consider my cousin Becky. She's also been in some videos. And I was saying this to Becky the other day and she was like, if I was your regent, every week I would say, hello Bookish Kingdom, there is once again no new video. <laughs> I keep telling Becky she needs to do a podcast with me and she's constantly like, no, I'm sorry. It's so much fun to have her in videos though. And I feel like if she was willing to be my regent, she would be hilarious. All right, our next question. Much literature of the regency period is categorized as romantic. What word would you use to describe today's literature? So, uh, I was having such a hard time with this question. And honestly, I don't really have a good answer because I don't read much of today's literature. So I feel like I can't ad accurately categorize it because I don't have enough familiarity with it. You know, I prefer to read the classics of the past. I feel like in another hundred years, I'll know what was written today that is actually worth reading. But right now I can't guess. And like when I go to the bookstore, I, I like look at the covers and read the backs of books. They do not appeal to me. They do not not seem like they would be worth my time. In the epistle, St. Paul says, like, test everything and make sure what you're putting in yourself, like, is good for you and healthy for you. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that gets published today, it doesn't seem like it would be very healthy. I'm afraid my, like, trust in most mainstream things, like mainstream media, like, popular things is, is very, very low. <laughs> I tend to be I tend to be more esoteric in my taste. So I feel like the only words I could describe modern literature as would be pejorative. And I don't really, I'm not really familiar w enough with it to like even pick a word. I mean, I guess I could pick divisive because I do sometimes like pick up books and I feel like they are so slanted in one direction or another. And it's just so frustrating because a book should be meant to expand your mind, not to narrow it. And it's really frustrating when you pick up a book that's like just supposed to be on some neutral topic and like within the first pages, the author is like, totally political for no reason. There was some book I was reading, I think it was one of those Huga Higa books, and it was just supposed to be about like ways to be cozy, right? But I open up the first page and the, the, the author is suddenly complaining about the 2016 American election. And like, he's, he's not even American. And he's acting like he has a right to tell Americans how to vote. And like, it just bothers me when people act like, oh, you're not allowed to vote for this person or they're not allowed to vote for that person. Okay, in, in a lot of elections, you're basically choosing between two bad apples, but you are allowed to follow your conscience and vote for who you want to vote for. And if you say, oh, anyone who votes differently from me is my enemy, like you have to be my ally or else you're my enemy. I just think that's such a terrible warlike attitude because like then you're basically declaring war on anybody who has a different opinion. Like you're not willing to dialogue with them or try to understand them or try to find common ground. And unfortunately, that's what I see a lot. And the reason I love classics so much is I feel like they are so multifaceted. They portray truly diverse mindsets and points of view and characters trying to get along and good people doing bad things and bad people unexpectedly doing good things. That's why I read, you know, so I think that's probably why I tend to read more from the past. All right, next up. Shakespeare's plays were popular during the Regency. What artistic performance have you recently enjoyed? Movies, TV, and music can all count. This question was totally making me want to go and watch another Shakespeare play. I have seen some Shakespeare plays at different places. My cousin Becky and I saw one at the Globe when we visited London, and that was so special. Whenever you go see a Shakespeare play, I feel like sort of hidden behind the scenes are like the 500 years of other Shakespeare performances 
that have taken place all around the world. And it's just this magical experience to go in person, you know, not just watching a, a movie or a TV, but like to go in person. Another artistic thing that I recently did, which I guess wasn't really a performance, um, but I went to the National Portrait Gallery in DC and I just spent a couple hours wandering through the rooms, reading all the plaques, seeing the actual paintings, the brush strokes, learning about the artists and the people from the past that they portrayed. And it was so much fun. It felt like time travel. It felt like I just had forgotten about the modern world for a little while. In fact, towards the end, it was getting dark out and I happened to catch a glimpse through the window of this like garish neon light. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's right. I still live in the 21st century. <laughs> but in-person artistry, whether it's going to see a play or like going to see paintings at a gallery or something, it's just so enriching. Next up, the Regency period was characterized by high fashion. What is a current fashion or trend in the book community that you adore or detest? So I feel like detest is too strong of a word, but one thing that I don't really like and have never gotten into is book talk. I've never downloaded TikTok. Um, and honestly though, it's not just TikTok that's the problem. It's like these short, short videos. And the thing is that like some of them are very clever and very funny and like you definitely can get value out of them. But I do feel like the just genre and the, the format is pernicious because it's like feeding into this addiction to social media, this addiction to our phones. And like, you know, you watch a short little 15 second video about a book and your brain then thinks that you know about that book. But the thing is that even if you say watched a long, say a long form podcast or video review of that book, and didn't read it. Like you still wouldn't really understand that book. And if once you read the book for yourself and have your own thoughts about it, okay, then you're understanding it more. But even that's not enough. A lot of books, especially classics, like you really need to read them multiple times. You need to listen to many different perspectives on them. But I do think this short form content where it's just one after the next, after the next, after the next, like your brain doesn't have time to really engage with the subject, but like, you're sort of being tricked into thinking you have engaged with the subject. So yeah, it's not that like they're all bad, it's just the nature of the the medium makes me really uncomfortable. So like I don't tend to do shorts on YouTube. I prefer like having a longer video where we can sit down and like have more of a discussion or Substack. I've really been enjoying um, my Substack and writing longer pieces on there. Last but not least, Jane Austen's novels show us the importance of etiquette in the drawing rooms of Regency England. Tell us about your personal rating system System, the etiquette of reading. So uh, I have such bad answers for these questions. <laughs> so I do not use Goodreads and I do not do numerical ratings like, like TikTok. Like a numerical rating on a book is just deceptive because a book can't be boiled down into like one, two, three, four, five. Especially a good book has so many different dimensions and it might be a five on one level and a one on another. So just as Jane Austen deals with like the etiquette of her society, but like you can tell that she has a very deep view of what manners actually are. Um, in Mansfield Park, when Edmund and Mary Crawford are having like this conversation about pastors and the church, I love how Edmund brings up this idea of manners. Miss Crawford must not misunderstand me or suppose I mean to call preachers the arbiters of good breeding, the regulators of refinement and courtesy, the masters of the ceremony of life. The manners I speak of might rather be called conduct, perhaps, the result of good principles, the effect, in short, of those doctrines which it is their duty to teach and recommend. And it will, I believe, be everywhere found that as the clergy are or are not what they ought to be, so are the rest of the nation. But I love that because I feel like, you know, a lot of people look at Jane Austen and think it's just about this superficial, you know, etiquette, the, the ceremonies of life, the regulators of refinement and courtesy. But actually, I feel like she's saying right here, no, what I'm talking about are manners as in conduct, good principles. Like, are you actually practicing what you preach? Are you actually following the doctrines that you say you believe? Even when it's hard and I think that's what her heroines um, and heroes all end up doing um, and yeah so similarly I feel like my etiquette when it comes to uh, reviewing books is is trying to go deeply into that individual book and just show how it touched me, what ins what about it inspired me, what about it has stuck with me after reading it but like a sort of quick and dirty numerical rating I just can't do. <laughs> All right, friends, there it is. I hope you enjoyed this Feb Regency tag video. I hope you'll do it as well. If you do, definitely let us know. I'd love to hear how you guys answer these questions. Tell me what you're reading for Feb Regency down in the comments. I did let myself buy a beautiful vintage copy of Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Byron, which I'm excited to read. I'm also excited to start my reread of Belinda. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay bookish. Bye.